Hi again everyone and uh, welcome to this sort of third in the series of uh, pure data and digital audio uh, presentations. Um, what we're looking at today is digital audio real-time manipulation and analysis um, and we're going to look at audio sample playback and manipulation. So, so far we have played back some pre-recorded digital audio but we haven't really manipulated that playback at all. We've started the file, we've played it from the beginning, we've finished at the end, that's it. We haven't tried to scratch around inside the file and loop uh, little sections of it or do anything else to it. So to start with, I'm, we're going to look at that. Um, next, we're going to look at real-time audio analysis. This is how we start to unpack some of the things that are going on in audio. Um, we're going to use, look at the Fourier transform, which lets us unpack the signal that's coming in from the digital audio and understand and identify the strengths of various sort of frequencies and the strength of various uh, components that are making up that more complex sound. Then we're going to look at pitch tracking, how you can use the fiddle object in pure data to track the pitch of, a, um, of sounds coming into the computer. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up with some real-time audio filtering. So to start with, let's look at this um, digital audio playback. And I mentioned we've already played back a file using the read SF object. Um, and let's open that up and do that. Make myself smaller. So, so far we've done something like this. We've had the read SF object, which when we send an open message to loads in a sound file from disk. And when we send it the one message, plays back the audio that we've just loaded in. Um, so that's fine. Um, the, the problem with it is if we want to um, play that, that same loop again, we have to load the file from disk again and trigger the playback. And this is a bit boring and it's a bit limiting and if we want to do some more interesting audio manipulation um, it's not going to take us very far. So, to get more control over our digital audio we need to work at a lower and slightly more complicated level in pure data and what we're going to do is use arrays to load that digital audio into memory and then we can use a sawtooth oscillator to help us play the samples. So um, last week we looked at the sawtooth oscillator amongst others. We looked at the sine wave oscillator, sawtooth oscillator, um, square wave, uh, etc. Um, and it turns out that the sawtooth oscillator is kind of useful and is one way to help us play back some samples. So let's take a look at this. Um, I should say um, that at that m this example pretty much almost unchanged comes from a nice video um, put out by uh, Dr. Rafael Hernandez. Uh, we've already used some of his other videos in the labs. Um, this particular one is um, Pure Data 22 Advanced Audio with Tabreed 4. So if you don't understand my explanation, go and check out his. You might make a lot of things a lot clearer. Um, we're probably going to emphasize slightly different things, which is the reason that I'm sort of making this video at all, rather than just pointing you directly to his. So let's open up the patch that we're going to be talking about. So let me just give you a guided tour of this patch to start with, so we can see what it does. Um, when I click up here, it loads in that same sample that I loaded before. You can hear that playing in the background, I hope. Um, but this patch lets us do more than just play it. So you can first of all hear that it's looping that uh, little sample which is about four seconds long. We can click down here to start playing the sample from the beginning. We can play it from the middle or any other arbitrary place we wanted to start playing the sample. If we wanted to start playing it, you know, after two seconds or one second or anywhere we liked, we could um, jump to that point. We can also use a slider to scratch around inside from beginning to end of the sample, like this.
And now we're moving backwards, forwards. And doing all kinds of weird stuff. Moving around inside our sample. And because... I'm just going to turn the audio off for a sec. Um, because we have the sample loaded into memory, we're not continually loading from disk, um, so we're sort of we've got a lot more flexibility with our access to this audio and what we do with it. Um, so let's have a look at how it works. There's a few different objects. We have the sound filer object here. Uh, this loads um, a um, sound file into memory, and you send it a message. So if you look at the documentation for SoundFiler, you'll see a number of different messages. We're sending it the read message, telling it to read a file from disk into memory. We're using the resize uh, argument to say, when you send this sound file to an array, resize the array so that it can fit this sound file in it. So when we create the arrays over here, we can create them with any size we like. Um, and if we use the resize argument, then when it loads the file, it will automatically make our array big enough to fit in whatever file we're loading. Um, we then pass in the name of the file, go down gambling, in this case, .wav, and then we tell it to take the audio channels from this file. This is a stereo audio file, so it has both a left and a right channel in it. And we tell it to take the first channel and stick it in an array called left channel. And take the second channel of audio and stick that in an array called right channel. And I should point out, should have pointed out before, that arrays in pure data um, you create in your patches, a lot like any other kind of object in pure data, you'll see this in the put menu, an array is one option. Um, you give an array a name and you can give it a size as well. In this case, because we're using this resize argument here, the size of an array that we create doesn't matter. Um, and we say OK and then pure data creates the array for us, which I now can't move. There we go. So you can see that's how you create an array. So when I was creating this patch in the first place, that's what I did. And I gave my arrays the name left channel and the name right channel. And stuck them over there. OK, enough about that. Let's get rid of that one. So we're reading the go down gambling file into our, these two arrays. Soundfiler does that for us. And what it sends out its outlet is the number of samples that it's loaded. So last week we talked about samples. And we mentioned that um, a typical sampling rate is sort of 44 kilohertz, 44,100 samples per second. <coughs> um, and that's what this particular file uses as well. Um, so SoundFiler has said, yeah, that, this SoundFiler has 179,584 samples in it. So that's how we load our samples into the arrays. What we now need to do Let's just jump down here. I'm going to skip this bit for a sec. Let's jump and look down here. What we now need to do is somehow or other use these objects, tab read 4, to read through the samples that are in these arrays and send them out to our digital analog converter, send them out to our speakers. So the tab read 4 object takes in its inlet, the index of the array um, for the sample we want to read out. So if we want to read the very first sample out of left channel, we would send in the number 0 to tab read 4 here, and that would output the value of the very first sample in the left channel array. Um, and if we wanted to read the very l the uh, the last sample, we'd send out the number uh, 179,583. That would send out the value of the very last sample in our left channel array here. So what we expect in the inlet 
is the sample, the number of the sample we want to send out. So if you think about it, to play, to play back our sound file from the beginning to the end, we're going to need to somehow feed in zero at the beginning of the sound file, and then send in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, etc., etc., up to one hundred seventy-nine thousand five hundred eighty-three. Um, if we send those numbers um, at the right rate into the inlet of tab read four, it will send out the actual samples out to our digital analog converter, and we'll hear the playback of the sound file. So if we want to play back the sound file at the, the same tempo it was recorded at, we're going to need to somehow figure out how long it is. So over what time period do we send out the values from 0 to 179,583? Um, so we're going to need to figure out the length of the file, and we're going to need to figure out the, um, some sort of mechanism to make sure that we send out those numbers at the appropriate rate so then the file doesn't play back too fast or too slow. Okay, so that's what our goal is. So that's to send that we need to figure out a way to send the right numbers at the right time to tab read 4. That's what we do up here. So we go back up to the top here to our number of samples loaded, 179,000 and something, 584. If we want to figure out how long our file uh, lasts for, how long our little sample lasts for, we divide the number of samples by the sampling rate which as we mentioned is 44,100 samples per second in this instance. So we divide 179,584 by 44,100. That will tell us how long our sample runs for. And as you can see in this case, it's just a tiny bit over 4 seconds, 4.0722 seconds. Now, in order to send the, um, the numbers from 0 up to 179,583 at the appropriate time, there's a few different uh, mechanisms, mechanisms we can use. The mechanism that we're using today is to use phaser uh, oscillator. So if you remember last week, we talked about the phaser oscillator and how the phaser oscillator would send out a sawtooth wave that basically went from 0 uh, this video is the wrong way around, from 0 to 1 and then jump back down from 0 and go up to 1 jump back down to 0, ramp up to 1 and it would do that over and over again at a, at a rate that we specified. So if I create a phaser object down here, let's show you how this works and we say give it a frequency of 1 and we'll just send its output into some random object for now, just so we can actually get a look at it. I'm going to turn the magic glass on. Magic glass is very useful, it means I can look at what's coming uh, down these pipes out of the outlets um, from PD objects. Um, if I turn the audio on, it's kind of volume down, um, then we can see here what's coming out of phaser Hopefully you can see it, although it's um, jerking around a little bit. It's outputting the numbers from 0 to 1. Uh, and it's doing that every, once per second. If I slow down our rate and say, let's go from 0 to 1. At a rate of 0.25 hertz, that is once every 4 seconds we can see that the number is ramping from 0 to 1 much more slowly. And I should emphasize that even though what we're seeing here um, sort of looks like that number is moving very jerkily, it's actually moving quite smoothly. It's just um, sort of an artifact of the way the magnification looks like it's having an effect here. If, you, if I zoom out a bit, you actually see it seems to be moving more in a way that we'd expect. So we now we have an object here which can output for us um, the numbers from 0 to 1 at a rate that we specify. Um, and if you think about it, if we multiply those numbers by the number of samples in our, um, in our audio, 
we have a nice way of counting from zero up to the number of samples we got. So if you think about it, zero times the number of samples loaded is zero. One times the number of samples loaded is, in this case, uh, what was it, 179,584. If we, um, so if we multiply uh, the output of our phaser by the number of samples, we're going to actually get a bit like a for loop going from zero up to the maximum number of samples. And that's going to do that at the rate that we specify. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take the output of the phaser, going from zero to one, we're going to multiply it by, you see I've connected up the outlet up here, of the number of samples down to the multiplication box down here. So we're going to take the output of our phaser, counting from zero to one, multiply it by the number of samples, feed the output of that, which as you can see is ramping between zero and 179,580 something. If I output that into the inlet of Stabreed 4 and send the output to our DAC, we should be hearing the playback of our audio file um, coming through. And that's what's happening. You can hear there's the audio playing. But how do we figure out what the frequency in Hertz is of the phaser? It's the runtime. It's the inverse of the runtime. One divided by the runtime. So the frequency in Hertz, if we've got a runtime of four seconds, our frequency in Hertz will be 0.25. In other words, going from zero to one over four seconds. So that's what we want. So there's a nice little object called inv, which basically when you feed a number in the top, gives you the inverse of that number. It outputs one divided by the input. So now we have a complete patch, which hopefully, even though you might not be able to, I wouldn't expect that you could program this from the beginning in pure data, um, because it, you know, it, it, it is a bit, um, it's, it's a bit, com it's, it's complicated, it's a bit low level, and I wouldn't necessarily expect you would be able to sort of sit down with a blank patch and, and program this up, but hopefully you understand enough about this now to look, take a look at this and, and basically understand what's going on. Um, and in your projects you can take this patch and hack it and perhaps use it to play back um, samples in interesting ways, manipulate the, play, manipulate the playback speed for example, um, sc scratch around inside a sample um, and play it back at different, different uh, sections of a sample uh, based on whatever you're, based on something that your user is doing. Um, so, a couple of other things we might, you might want to poke around with. If you change the runtime, you can play the samples back faster or slower. And as you can hear, when you play, play them back faster, the pitch goes up. And when you play them back slower, the pitch goes down. As you can see, there is hours of fun to be had messing around with this. So uh, even though it, it may sort of do your head in a little bit, um, do take a look at this patch, come to grips with it. As I say, I don't expect you guys, you all to be able to play this, to be able to play this, to be able to uh, program this patch up from scratch, but I would expect you to be able to kind of sit down and nut it out and basically get an idea of what's going on given a, a little bit of time. Um, and I do think it will be a very useful patch for you to perhaps use, particularly obviously if you're doing um, interactive musical instrument as your assignment. Uh, that's that. Um, any questions, please post them uh, either underneath the, uh, underneath the video on YouTube or um, in UTS Online. That's it. Uh, next up, we'll be looking at audio analysis.